Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I'm really happy to have you here with me today. It is a very autumny feeling day today and we are getting a little bit of rain, which I am exceedingly grateful for because it's been so dry and we had lots of lightning last night. So all this rain could not come at a better time. The other thing that you will notice is that the smoke has cleared out. So this is kind of an impromptu video, but I was going down to the high tunnel to, oh my goodness, to do some work. And I thought you might enjoy coming along with me because I have a ton of harvesting and pruning to do down there. And after watching my crazy overgrown high tunnel all summer, it will probably be quite satisfying to watch me actually clear a ton of it out. Oh, the cows are up a little bit closer to the fence. Can you see fern right down there behind the red cow? I would take you down to see them, but this rain is starting to come down now. I love working down in the high tunnel when it's raining like this, because it sounds so cozy. So this is the situation in the high tunnel. It's getting rather narrow. So this is the middle row that I have actually been doing a relatively good job staying on top of with the pruning but I haven't touched it in about two weeks. So it's a jungle. Over on this side, we can't even get down. <laughs> Literally at all, not without cutting out a bunch of all of this green foliage. So I am gonna cut back pretty much everything that does not have fruit on it because there's nothing on here that's actually going to be able to produce fruit at this point. We are gonna be heading into getting regular frosts here in the next week. Wow, it's really coming down. Um, so I'm just going to go and take as much off of it as I can. Look at these tomatoes. These are so beautiful. They're starting to get a blush on them. A little bit of cracking there. That's not a big deal. I did give them a really deep water about a week or so ago, and that's probably what that cracking's from. Cracking is usually from when there's a lot of water and then the fruit expands really quickly and the skin doesn't have time to adjust to that growth. Tomatoes to harvest in here, that's exciting. Look at that beauty. Another one up here. Cutting back all of these leaves and branches is really gonna give us a good idea of what we're dealing with for the amount of tomatoes that are actually in this high tunnel. So if you're new here, my tunnel is 60 by 21, I think, or so. And we are in a zone 3B with around 110 frost-free days. Sometimes a little bit longer, but um, the last couple of years we've been getting frost in the beginning of June. And um, usually we get at least one light frost in August, which we did this year, but it was a really light one, so it didn't cause much damage. But usually by this time of year, our frost-free days are numbered. So, I want to try to encourage as much ripening on the actual vines as we can get before the, um, the killing frosts come. We have a bunch of ring of fire peppers in under here that we need to harvest. I can't believe that this little plant actually grew because all of these sunflowers that you can see around here grew up around them and I just decided to let them go. But even with all of that shade and lack of water, these guys did all right. My peppers this year were absolutely abysmal. The worst peppers I have ever had. They have only started actually growing in height and flowering prol prolifically right now. So obviously these flowers aren't gonna produce any fruit and there's really not a ton of fruit on these plants. There just was not enough heat early on in the season for really good peppers this year. Look at these sun golds, these are the only smaller tomatoes that I grow now because I just love them so much and none of the other ones really compare for me in flavor. I completely forgot about the basil. Do you guys remember, I don't know, probably a month ago now, we may as well pull all these guys out. These are some volunteer tomatillos and sunflowers, whoops. <laughs> And uh, so I've done a couple of harvests off of my basil. What I usually do is I try to keep my patch a little better maintained than this, that's for sure, is I cut my plants down to about here every time I harvest them several times throughout the year and then they grow back up again. So I get multiple harvests off of the same basil plants. This will be the final harvest that we get off of this 
basil, but we have managed to hold it off from bolting. It's just starting to flower here by doing all of this harvesting all summer. So this is a fairly small little patch of basil, but it's produced quite a bit of basil for me. So if you have a small area, this is a really good way to manage your basil for optimal harvest. Okay, where should we start? Let's start at the easiest one because I do believe I have most of the right fruit that we need to harvest in this row here. Like I said, I'm gonna be really ruthless and we're just gonna cut off everything that does not have fruit on it. I think I might even pull sunflowers down right now. Let's see, do we have much seed happening? Oh, there is quite a bit of seed on this one. Normally I don't need to save much seed because my plants drop seeds all over my garden and then I have tons of volunteer sunflowers. Every single sunflower that you see in this high tunnel is a volunteer. Um, but it's never a bad idea to save a little bit of seed just in case for whatever reason. I don't end up getting a bunch of sunflowers and as you know, I do love sunflowers in my garden. I got so much awesome feedback about sunflowers. So there's this thing going around the internet right now, especially over on Instagram, that says that planting sunflowers in your garden will cause stunted growth in the area around it due to some kind of chemical situation. That is definitely not playing out to be true in my garden and not in most of your gardens either. This is some research that was shared with me by one of you and then I of course did my own research afterwards. So the example that was shared with me is if you've ever noticed underneath a bird feeder there might be a ton of seed that gets dropped but not a lot of healthy plants that come up. I think the only one that that person noticed were Johnny Jump Ups that actually came up underneath their um, bird feeder but and that is due to the fact that the seeds themselves have properties that will inhibit the growth of other plants around where the seed falls. I think that's actually really ingenious of the plant to have a way to be able to drop the seed and stop the growth of other competing plants around it. Um, one of the things though that several people from California said is that because sunflowers take so much water when they grow, it's not a good idea to plant them in your garden if you do live in a drought prone area because they take so much water and that can stunt the growth of the plants around it due to the lack of water that they might get. And then of course there's the issue of shade because they're big, huge, beautiful plants and they might shade out the areas around where you plant them. I will always grow sunflowers in my garden no matter what and I let them come up wherever they do and it adds such beauty and whimsy to the garden and then lots of feed for the wild birds in the winter time or actually more in the fall. They usually have them all cleaned up for the most part by the end of September. All right, let's get into this. It might be really chilly outside, but it is toasty warm in here. Okay, let's just go at this. See how much we can get out of here. I can already see so much better in here. I do not want to take these big beautiful ones down, but I think I will take this one down over here. One side is done. I don't even think you guys could see me back there. Let's do the other side. I am being very ruthless here. So anything that has even small fruit that I know is not going to develop, I'm taking off. But I'm happy to say, look at all these gorgeous tomatoes on here. So there's lots of tomatoes. These Amish paste did so well under extremely challenging circumstances this year. It has been a heck of a year for the high tunnel. So I, um, the weather itself was challenging this year with a cold spring, and then we ended up with a hot spell in May out of the blue, and then I was gone for most of the month of June, so my high tunnel didn't get any care whatsoever during that period of time. And um, I kind of, decided about, I don't know, the end of July that I just wasn't going, going to stress 
that much about it, so it didn't get as much attention as it normally would. I just kind of resigned myself to the fact that maybe it wasn't gonna be a really good year for tomatoes. So I actually ended up going and buying, I think it was 500 pounds or something like that of tomatoes and canning those all up just because I was so sure that I wasn't going to get many tomatoes out of the high tunnel and I certainly am not going to get as many as I normally do. However, I do think that I'm going to end up getting um, more than I thought anyway, if this wall right here of tomatoes is any indicator. Lots and lots of little tomatoes in here that I'm gonna leave. These ones were, um, let's see if I can remember the variety, San Maranzo, Mar Marzano, Marzano, San Mar Marzano, I think it's called. And they are very prolific all in behind here, but not uh, ripening very quickly. They're starting to. Can hardly blame them being neglected this way. <laughs> Good grief. Oh dear, whoops, just cut a nice, clump off of there. Tons of green tomatoes or green tomato recipes that you can utilize, which I certainly will be this year. Some of my tomatoes this year are just beautiful size-wise. So many red tomatoes hiding in here. So if you ever wondered what tomatoes look like when they are completely neglected, this is how they look. So you can see in under here, this is another reason why it is a very good idea to prune. So you can actually see what you have. I have a whole clump of tomatoes here that rotted. Let's see if that one's, yeah, this whole clump is rotten. And that is simply because I didn't see them there. So we will take that off so that it doesn't rot these other ones that are here. Look at all of these tomatoes in under here. So many of them, so, so many, look at them all. Look at how beautiful these are. Wow, can't wait to see what's down there. One of my kiddos just told me that there's rainbows out here, oh Where? my gosh. Can you see the rainbow coming right down into the meadow? You wanna run down there and see if you can find the end of it? Okay, go for it. Look at the rainbow, so it goes from there all the way over there and there's actually I don't know if you can see the faint second rainbow this time of year we get the most beautiful rainbows so lovely and I am very happy with the number of tomatoes that we have on these vines there's lots and lots of them and hopefully now that the light can actually get down in here these are going to actually ripen if we could just get one more week of no frost um, or even if light frost is fine because that won't impact it in here, then uh, we might actually be able to ripen most of these on the vine, which would be amazing. There's so many volunteer tomatillos in here. Goodness. This row on this side definitely got the worst of it as far as the consequences of my lack of attention this year. Um, fortunately, that one clump of tomatoes that I showed you earlier was the only uh, rotten tomatoes that I found. So that's really good. There's tons of green tomatoes along this side, lots of ripe tomatoes along here that we're gonna harvest shortly, but we have one more side that we need to do before we can call it done. My goodness. Look at that tomato. I cannot wait to pick all these. My goodness, there are some beautiful tomatoes in here. I do have some splitting happening, so I definitely wanna get all these harvested up. I am so excited right now to pick tomatoes. There are some stunning tomatoes in here. So it might've been a bit of a fail as far as the quantity and the maintenance and all of that. But I think it's possible that the most beautiful tomatoes that I have ever grown are hiding in some of this mess. So let's go find out. 
I am going to start with the more boring ones, <laughs> like the Amish paste, although they did very, very well this year. But we'll start with these ones and then we will move our way over to where there's some of the more beautiful tomatoes. I am going to get enough to make something out of this. I ordered some peppers that I can't grow here for the enchilada sauce. And I'm really hoping, because Dan's at the post office right now, that they are in. Because if they are, then we can make some enchilada sauce together. this tomato. It's humongous. Too bad these beauties split. That's about as many as I want to fit in this one. Look at that beautiful tomato. This one's one of my favorites, an old German. Look at how vibrant those are. They're almost glowing. Well, that's not too bad. We got that bin there and this bin over here and lots and lots of tomatoes still on the vine that will hopefully ripen over the next week or so. We're at the point of the garden now where the garden's days are numbered. We are going to get a killing frost very, very soon. So it's not gonna be long before we're gonna to have to come out and clear out the rest of what is in here. And I can see that we have some patty pans in there. My daughter-in-law is actually coming out tomorrow and she loves patty pans. So we'll fry up some of those for lunch tomorrow. Oh my goodness, what is that? I have absolutely no idea what kind of squash that beauty is. It is going to be a little bit of a mystery squash harvest this year because I did pick up quite a few plants from the nursery and I did put the tags in beside them, but those tags have been gobbled up by the soil and the plants. So who knows? It's gonna be like a treasure hunt. The Brussels sprouts are looking fantastic. I think these are the most beautiful Brussels sprouts that I have ever grown, so that's exciting. This keeps getting bigger by the second. It's still not looking like it's gonna crack, so we'll leave it for a little bit yet. And when I was looking over here yesterday, look what I found. A whole bunch of pumpkins. Can you see that one in there? Look at that one, it's huge. Normally, so these are Dills Atlantic and there's only two Dills Atlantic giant plants here. And I'll normally only get one good size pumpkin off of each plant, but this year, for whatever reason, look at that beauty. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven over there. So that's kind of weird because like I said, normally I get one maximum of two pumpkins, Dills Atlantics per plant. And this year it's abundant Dills Atlantic year for some reason. The garden has definitely been a little bit strange this year, that is for sure. Lots and lots and lots of onions, and I think what I'm gonna do right now is go and knock the tops over of the onions. They're pretty close to doing that naturally at this point anyway. And what that will do is it will signal to the plant that it's time to put all of the sugars into the bulb in preparation for overwinter storage. And you can see how easily they're flopping over at this point. Probably would have just been a couple of days until they did this naturally, but I want to get these out of the garden and curing for winter. And then up over here, we have our beautiful kale that will wait until we have a good frost before we do most of this harvesting. And then that will be pretty much it. I don't feel quite ready for the change of seasons yet, but I'm getting there. 
and it was such a bad fire year this year for smoke and everything and winter means no fires and I'm very much looking forward to that. Look at how beautiful the apples are looking on the tree. Let's see if they're ready. Mm. Oh, that is good. Normally I film in the morning, but it's actually later in the day today. So I'm going to sign off for today and I'll be back with you again tomorrow and we'll figure out what we're gonna make with those tomatoes. All right, my friends, we are on to the second day. It's actually 4.30 p.m. I had a really busy day today, so I'm just getting around to making the enchilada sauce right now, but I've done a bunch of the prep work. I have 10 cups of onion chopped over here. We're going to make a double batch, and this recipe is out of the Ball Blue Book, I think. I got it off of um, from online. This is the recipe that I made last year that was so fantastic. This is the, yeah, it's just the Ball website, but I wanted to show you the coolest thing that came in the mail today. Just one sec. This is a gift from Tony. Thank you so much, Tony. I love this so much, but this is the Ball Blue Book from 1943. Is that not the coolest thing and it's in such great condition and the photos in it are so fabulous. I'll show you my favorite one. Yeah, here it is. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? So I haven't actually had a chance to go through all of this yet and look at the recipes. Now, of course, because this book is from 1943, a lot of these recipes are probably not gonna fall under safe canning guidelines, but I am an experienced canner, and I will be able to determine which of these recipes are safe based on my experience, but I am really, really excited to read this. One of the things that I love about old books like this is not so much the recipes themselves, although those are fantastic as well, but I love all of the written description in it. So this is things every home canner should know. I won't read the whole thing. I'll put this up on my website if you wanna check this out, but it says, I haven't read this yet, so I have no idea, <laughs> but it says, home canned food should be attractive in color, pleasing in texture and flavor, and rich in nutritive value. Neither unusual skills nor expensive equipment is necessary for the protection of such food. Totally true, this is what I say all the time. But it is essential that one be familiar with the selection, the care, and the use of equipment, the cause and prevention of spoilage, and the selection and preparation of material to be canned, preserved, or pickled. The rules of canning are simple, the work is easy, <laughs> the work is easy. I would beg to differ on that one. I mean, I guess technically speaking, it's not a technical process, but the amount of labor as far as just chopping goes can be somewhat tedious at times and time consuming. And the results gratifying to those who follow instructions. Again, I would 100% agree with this. Variety and quantity to can. Home canning may, may be one person's hobby, another's habit, but now for millions, it is the only means of supplying a well-rounded diet. Interesting. An estimate should be made of the amount of each variety of food needed during the months when not in natural season. The amount to be canned in order to supply this need varies with geographical location, but a fair yearly average for a family of five is between 800 and 1,000 quarts. A budget or guide to be used in planning is given on page 12. No way, that is absolutely fantastic. So this is, we can around 1,000 jars, 1,000 quarts um, for our family, and we have a large family. So this is assuming, so this is for a family of five, um, is assuming that this is going to be the brunt of the food that you eat during the winter time because that is a lot of canned food. So I'm just gonna skip to page 12 because I am genuinely curious as to the formula that they use to determine. Okay, canning plan or budget. Okay, I will definitely take a picture of this and put it on my website for you. I'll put it up on the screen as well if you want to pause and look at that because this is fantastic. So fruits and jam juices, five per week, 36 weeks, uh, appro approximate size serving, one cup, amount needed for one person, 45 quarts, amount needed for a family of five, 225 quarts. This is fantastic, oh my goodness. Number of jars needed for canning one bushel of raw material. Apples, one bushel, 40 to 50 pounds, on average 20 to 22 quarts. Wow, this is actually gonna be handy for me. <laughs> this is fantastic. 
Oh my goodness, Tony, thank you so much. This is an absolute treasure. So I use the Ball Book of Canning um, all the time. That's kind of my main, the main book that I use for canning recipes. And today's recipe is off of the Ball website. I think I mentioned that already. So um, let's go through the recipe with you right now, what we need. 12 dried new Mexican chili peppers. So I actually ordered these off of Amazon in anticipation of making this video. Last year when I did that, or this recipe, I think I did roasted red peppers and it was absolutely delicious. So if you don't have peppers like these, that's fine. Put it up to the screen here because I'm not sure how to pronounce that. You probably can't really. Ah, there we go. Now you can see it um, for the name of them. So we need 24 of those, four cups of water, eight cloves of garlic, two tablespoons of olive oil, five cups of chopped onion, and remember, I'm doubling this recipe, and this will give you eight pints, this base recipe that I'm sharing with you right now, six cans of diced tomatoes, a half a cup of dark brown sugar, two tablespoons of chili powder, two teaspoons of salt, two teaspoons of ground cumin, and one teaspoon of ground red pepper. So I'll walk you through all the steps. So what we need to do is open up our peppers here. Oh, and I probably should mention, because for those of you that have been here before, you've probably noticed that I have a new stove behind me. And I shared, I think two months ago now, that we were wanting to transition back to white appliances. We've had stainless steel appliances now for about five years, I think. Um, and when our fridge died two months ago, Wait, this is not working. Hang on one second, I need to focus here on opening this. So two months ago when our fridge died, we bought a new fridge and that is this all fridge over here and it's a Danby, that's the brand, or Danby, I mean. And we went with a white one knowing that our stove was on the way out. So our stainless steel stove was starting to um, just work less and less efficiently as the months had progressed over about the last six months. And then a couple of days ago, that was the end of it. And our dishwasher also, so all of our appliances get a ton of use in our home and usually our dishwashers last about four years on average. So our dishwasher was also due to be replaced. So we bought a Bosch dishwasher over here. We have tried other brands of dishwashers over the years, but the Bosch is the one that lasts the longest. And then the um, stove is a Samsung stove. I really wanted to go back to white appliances because for us anyway, I found stainless steel really difficult to keep clean. Every single drip mark um, shows up on them. They scratched really easily and dented really easily. And I also wanted the brightness. Our house can be a little bit dark in the winter time. And I found that the stainless steel and black appliances really absorbed the light and just made the house look darker. So I'm really happy to have white appliances again. I just wanted to address that because I know somebody's gonna notice that there's a new stove back there. So I have done some of the prep work. So what we're gonna do is take our peppers here and we need 24 of them. Oh, they smell so good. Oh my goodness. One, two, three, four. And what it says that we need to do with these is toast them on a hot griddle for eight to 10 seconds on each side, just until they're beginning to puff and blister. We wanna make sure that they don't burn or they will become bitter. Okay, so we're just gonna cover these with boiling water once we're done cooking them. We'll get our kettle going over here. And we'll also get a bowl to put these in as they finish cooking. This enchilada sauce is so incredibly delicious. So we'll wait till this gets nice and hot. Tomatoes chopped up over here. This recipe does call for uh, crushed canned tomatoes or chopped canned tomatoes, but I have decided to use fresh tomatoes. I'll just have to cook them down a little bit more than I would have to if I was using ones that were already pre-canned. Okay. These are starting to puff up a little bit. So it just says eight to 10 seconds per side. Okay, that was a smoky job. Okay, so now we're gonna pour 
boiling water on here. Set our timer for 20 minutes. And now, where's our pot? Here's our pot. We are going to cook our onion and our garlic in some olive oil here. So this is 10 cups of delicious, sweet smelling onions. Oh, I wanted to tell you because I had pointed out yesterday that this was such a gorgeous tomato. Where is it? There we go. This beautiful tomato, which is called a lemon boy, not a fan. It is stunning. Look at how yellow that is. It's so beautiful, but it is almost, I'll have to take another taste because I tasted this yesterday. And I mean, look at how pretty that is, but it tastes kind of watery. Like it really just does not have a lot of flavor to it. If you don't like a really strong flavored tomato, then this might be a really good option because it's not <clears throat> um, acidic at all. I wonder if the one yesterday was an outlier because this is not nearly as bad <laughs> as I thought it was yesterday, but it is really, really mild. There's not a lot of flavor to it. And this beauty, this one is called a bull's heart. I believe, and it looks like it was two tomatoes that decided to become one tomato. It's definitely the biggest tomato I've ever grown, for sure. These ones are really nice flavor too. They're not quite as acidic as these guys are. They're kind of a mix actually between these two tomatoes, but they're all good. I love tomatoes. Do you know what's really awesome? is last year, and I don't know why this happened, but I could not eat tomatoes raw without getting sores in my mouth. It was like an instant reaction to the acidity of the tomatoes, and it didn't matter what kind of tomato it was, and I was so discouraged because I love tomatoes so much, and I especially love to walk through my greenhouse and just eat them raw, but it was kind of an anomaly. I don't know what was going on in my body that was causing that to happen, but it is not happening this year. And I cannot tell you how happy I am about it because like I said, I love tomato products so much. Okay, I think we are ready to blend up this gorgeous smelling sauce. Get some of this beautiful sauce blended up here. So once we've blended it up, we're gonna cook it down until it is nice and thick and has darkened somewhat, although it has already darkened quite a bit. Mm, smells amazing. I definitely have to give it a little taste. This is absolutely delicious, but I will say it packs a little bit more heat than I personally really like. It's good, but, it, but it's spicy. These peppers were supposed to be really mild and what I should have done is tried one of them, or at least a piece of one of them, um, before I put, how many did I put in here anyway? Was it like 24 or something like that? It was a lot of peppers in here. The flavor is absolutely incredible, but it, like I said, it does pack a little bit of heat, which my kids who like heat are going to absolutely love. I am definitely going to have to make another double batch and just use a couple of these peppers and do like I did last year, which was to roast up a bunch of red peppers and use um, red peppers in place of all of the spicier peppers. The flavor of these peppers though is incredible. And if you do like heat, I think most people would not think this was very spicy, but I just have a really sensitive mouth to spice. Um, the flavor, like I said, the flavor of these is, is delicious. So what we're gonna do here is plop this back on the stove. We are going to put our lid, cause this is probably gonna spit a little bit but we'll put it so that it can let some of the steam out so it can thicken up. We'll clean up a little bit of our mess here. Wow, this is not gonna make anywhere near the amount that the recipe said. So this should have done 16 pints, but it's definitely not gonna do that. 
which is actually okay <laughs> since this turned out to be way spicier than I was hoping it would be. So I think what I'm gonna do, because it is getting late in the day and this canning process, whoops, um, is going to take some time, is I will show you the finished jars in my next video and we'll sign off today's video right here. And I will see you again in a couple of days and I'm sure we're gonna get up to some more canning because it is that time of year and I'm basically canning every day at this point. I hope that you enjoyed this video, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.